would like to thank all of you for embracing me as a new member. And I would like to extend thanks also to Susan Hepperville and Walter for inviting me to give a presentation. This is quite an honor. My title, The Sons of Fire and Spiritual Experience, is asking at its core, what is the spiritual experience? As Susan often reminds us, our themes are usually complicated investigations, and unfortunately, I have set for myself a rather complicated aim, one quite humbling. While much of my discourse will reference Emanuel Swedenborg, discussing Swedenborg is not my central and foremost purpose. He would not have it so. Swedenborg suggested that one should study Aristotle, not for understanding Aristotle, but rather for understanding one's own self. I do hope, however, that he may in some way cast a light from that distant past to illuminate our way into what undoubtedly is a mystery. To aid in our view, I set as our horizon contributions from theosophical thinkers who were, like he, not only concerned with our cosmological thrust into being, but also with our evolutionary status, our involvement in, our relationship to, our experience within the whole of this cosmic adventure in which we find ourselves immersed. I will not focus on the question, why is there something rather than nothing, but rather on what that something could possibly be or on what that something is, at least in the minds of our most prominent thinkers. I will focus very briefly on Swedenborg as a scientist in the age of enlightenment when reason and science were secularizing the world, the religious or spiritual challenges he faced while he was in London engaged in the new science and suggests that the church, the state and science and decisions made how they impacted him, and they impacted him in very much the same way that they are impacting us today. I will also suggest that Swedenborg attempted to unify faith and reason, but attempted to demonstrate that the organic, the vivacious nature of the spiritual world was not for him an intellectual formulation. It was rather an inbreathing, a living, a thriving heaven on earth. To the God who was in the fire and who was in the waters. To the God who has suffused himself through all the world. To the God who was in summer plants and in the lords of the forest. To that God be adoration. Adoration. Alice Bailey used this mantra from the Shavateshvatara Upanishad, which dates back from the 6th to 4th century BC. It opens her work, A Treatise on Cosmic Fire, with a dedication to H. P. Blavatsky, dedicated with gratitude. Bailey worked telepathically on this project and many projects with the Master D.K., also known as Joao Kuhl, a name we also see in the writings of H. P. B. This poetic mantra is short, consisting of 113 verses, combining two Sanskrit terms, sveta, asva, pure, senses, translated, one who has controlled his senses, another translation, svet, white horse, asva, drawn by white steeds, tara, carrying beyond or crossing, translated, the one carrying beyond on white horse, it opens with familiar and persistent metaphysical questions. Is Brahma the cause? Whence are we born? Whereby do we live? Whither do we go? It concludes that one God, the self, is within all things, that God, non-God, the eternal, is within itself, and that the primal cause is the innate power within each individual, that self-knowledge or Atman is the final goal. It addresses our experience and attempts to solve our problem of the one and the many. The universe exists in every individual, expressing itself in every creature, that everything in the world is a projection of it, and that there is oneness, a unity of souls in one and only self. The problem of the one and the many was also pervasive throughout Western philosophical investigations, from the one of Parmenides, 
throughout the Middle Ages to the mid-century monads of Leibniz, who in 1710 published his theodicy, Essays on the Goodness of God, the Freedom of Man, and the Origin of Evil, a work that promoted optimism during his era. We are all familiar with the Leibnizian phrase, the best of all possible worlds, a central theme of this work, indicating that the existing world is the best world God could have created. This inspired Swedenborg to later write his own work entitled The Divine Providence. Two years later, Leibniz published his monadology, an attempt in part to address the problem of the one and the many. He posits his idea of pre-established harmony and monads as proceeding from the divine substance. Monads all have the same qualities with only a slight distinction. This term monad comes from the Greek term monas. It has a long history in Western philosophy. It is thought to have originated with the Pythagoreans representing the first point, the first spark of the divine flame as manifesting. Monad means something ultimate, singular, simple. The term monos means alone. Leibniz was a, ma a mathematician, and he was aware of Euclid's first, first notion that things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. Each monad represents the whole universe, each living, each the very spark of the divine, each formless. This teaching of the monad continues in both our theosophical and physical sciences. Here is a partial table of contents from Swedenborg's The Divine Providence. Note that there is a focus on the unity of being. In a certain image, the one is in every created thing. Number two, the end of the divine providence is that every created thing shall be such a one. Number three, the Lord does not suffer anything to be divided. Number six, an image of the infinite and eternal is in the variety of things and in the multiplication of things. Number seven, the universe with each thing and all things was created from the divine love by means of divine wisdom. Einstein, attempting to solve the problem of the plenitude, sought after a unified field theory. He observed the cosmic rays from the perspective of light and energy, sensing its movement as a wave-like behavior of massless particles known as photons. Today our physicists are continuously seeking proof of the unity of being, even exploring the realms of our elementals or the world of particles. This is the venue of particle physics experimentation. Here pictured is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. It's the most powerful particle accelerator in the world. It's a 16 mile circular ring with high energy particle beams moving in opposite directions close to the speed of light. They are then smashed onto targets or against each other. In the very center is the CMS, the compact muon solenoid, a huge magnet. It's formed into a cylindrical conducting cable that generates a field of four Tesla, which is about 100,000 times the magnetic field of the Earth. In the lower fourth of this photo, there is an engineer standing. This can give you some sense of how large this is. In 2013, scientist Peter Higgs was awarded the Nobel Prize for detecting the Higgs boson, named the God particle. Since then, smaller particles have been detected. I draw our attention back to Alice Bailey, who authored many works describing our multifaceted and extremely complex spiritual experience. I do so hoping that her modern day explication will assist our view into Swedenborg's 18th century spiritual experiences. Her viewpoint may help us understand the common ground of us all and the launch pad from which Swedenborg was thrusted, help us sort out what he was actually encountering. 108 years after Swedenborg's death, Alice Bailey is writing a treatise on cosmic fire, the labors of Hercules, the rays and the initiations, a treatise on white magic, death, the great adventure, all a literary framework of the human experience. Although Swedenborg did not use the word initiation, his term regeneration 
which is the process of the soul's movement into a higher and more glorious idealization, conceptually matches Bailey's initiatory process. Swedenborg's experiences with the dead share a similar focus, specifically that death is not a terminus. His work on heaven and hell contains a pithy resource of such experiences. Swedenborg, like Bailey, and like the ancient Egyptians before him, determined that death was a continuation. But what distinguishes Swedenborg's writings from the Egyptians, or what we even find in the Tibetan Book of the Dead are the many conversations he had with those who we call dead. He encountered them as living. In fact, many he encountered had no awareness of being dead. He took delight in these conversations, and apparently they also. The person leaves behind nothing except the body, and continuing onward with every sense, every memory, every thought, and affection had. It became obvious to Swedenborg that the thoughts the church had about death were in need of revision. I do wonder, did his mind reach those in the Devishan? Annie Besant, the second president of the Theosophical Society in her work The Ancient Wisdom, says this, Souls, having during their life by deep thinking and noble living sown much seed, the harvest belonging to the Devishanic region, great now is their reward for having so risen above the bondage of flesh. These noble, sown seeds or deeds of Annie Besant, Swedenborg agrees and also advises that what is meant is not the outwardly display of works, but works proceeding from the interior man. Blessed are the dead, their works follow them. I saw small and great standing in front of God. The books were opened, and they were judged according to their works. We find this comprehension entangled in our current phenomenological studies, especially considering the idea of the vanishing, as we can read in Hegel. That is the absencing and presencing of objects from our perceptual view. Think of it. Though objects seem fixed and on stable ground, our experience of them is not quite so. They are dynamic, fleeting, coming and going. In fact, it is as Plato suggested. We live in a world of recollection. The object is always remembered, residing within our mind or spirit. All of our existence is held this way, within our spiritual gaze, even on the physical plane. This is a secret Swedenborg understood. This awareness breaks the facade of death. Death is really a concept for dullards. The English poet and artist William Blake, not only were his many paintings inspired by Swedenborg, he annotated three of his works, The Divine Providence, Heaven and Hell, as well as The Divine Love and The Divine Wisdom. Let's take a look at Swedenborg's Divine Love. The Divine Love and the Divine Wisdom is wonderfully translated into English by John Ager. It begins as a metaphysical work, but proceeds to be so much more. It is Swedenborg's expose on the inseparability of essence and existence and our experience in the divine being. Essay and existe are such a one that it is impossible to separate them. The divine essence exists in all things the same. God is very man. Our experience and being is the presencing of this very God and the very divine love which God is. Man knows that there is such a thing as love, but he does not know what love is. He knows that there is such a thing as love from common speech as when it is says, he loves me. A king loves his subjects and subjects love their king. A husband loves his wife, a mother, her children. But although the word love is so universally used, hardly anybody knows what love is. He is wholly unaware that love is his very life. Divine love is divine because it is of divine wisdom, and the divine wisdom is divine because it is of divine love. Love was not merely abstract, but personal. It what unites us, warms us. It's our very heartbeat. In marriage love, he wrote, that the union of souls was a union of minds. A warmth, urging conjunction of our bosoms and in our bodies, lovers, 
are perpetually thinking of these inclinations in their experience of bliss, pleasure, and joy continues beyond the threshold we call death. No matter how hard we try, love will always defy description. But know that it unionizes the opposites. Here pictured is fire merging with water. It beckons the becoming onward while sculpturing the purposes. So let us ask, what is cosmic fire? Who or what are the sons of the fire mist? Blavatsky and Bailey share a similar ideology regarding the solar logos and manifestation, always warning that language is an obstacle to comprehension. Let us bear that in mind now. Blavatsky refers to the sons of the fire mist as the primordial seven, and there are various descriptions. The Theosophy Wiki describes the suns as beings that range from the highest of the planetary chohans and to the angels, the fashioners of the inner man, the first beings called minds, the seven sons of fire, distinguished into formless and corporeal qualities. They are the first beings to appear on the various planes of manifestation. This unfolding is a repetition of the as above, so below, a theme constantly repeated in Swedenborgian correspondence describing nature and everything contained as the language of God. The fires, while differentiated in matter or density, their qualities remain the same as they descend onto the last plane, our own. The human is endowed with the same potentiality or the fullness of the divine, and when recognized, the human is as the highest Dihan Chohan. Swedenborg framed his work around the idea of the heavenly man. Carl Jung called this the rotating arcane substance, the mystery of the whirlwind and the manner of the wheel. The great wind is fire and causes exaltation. Bailey and her work charts this interplay of the solar logos as the intermeshing of the infinitude of the microcosm, the reach of the rays, and the infinitude of the microcosm. This is chart three from Bailey's Cosmic Fire, a rudimentary attempt to pictorialize the seven planes of our solar system. Think of this as a caveman's drawing, as you know nothing like being or the solar planes can truly be diagrammed. Let me briefly explain the chart, should this be your first time seeing it. But allow me to explain referencing Aristotle's ontological arguments. This chart is a diagram of our placement in existence, or better yet, manifestation. Aristotle, seeking a creator, found it logically necessary to avoid an infinite regress, that is, having many creators and never finding a first creator. He therefore posits a first cause. The first cause is also the final cause, that towards which all things tend, hence the Alpha and the Omega. The first cause is uncaused and is itself immune to change, although it causes all things. The first cause is hence the unmoved mover. He argues that this unmoved first cause is the noesis, the noeseos, that is the thinking of thinking or the thinking that thinks itself. Now look at the top of the chart and you will see what can be surmised as something like the first cause. You will see the word divine. Underneath the term logos, which can be translated as reason or word, this implies the intelligibility of being. Underneath are all the other planes of manifestation, including our own. This chart depicts our relationship to the whole. We share in all of these various planes of the solar system. This chart is also the constitution of man. Remembering the principle as the as above, so below, imagine this chart displaying the solar local, so the solar angel commuting itself throughout in all of its fires, preserving our vitality. And also remember that words get in the way. This chart is not an anthropomorphic projection, nor is it a narcissistic being, a being that thinks itself as narcissistic, but rather it is an attempt to chart the unveiling of the highest, most transcendent first principle, the one, the good, the true, and love, and of course Plotinus added beauty, emanating throughout and unifying manifestation. This intelligibility which thinks itself is pervasive, 
throughout all of our own intellectual distinction distinctions this undifferentiated being is di is differentiated only by our own intellectual judgments and and our experience of language and our understanding we are also reminded that these levels are not stacked the one above the other but are the simultaneous interfusion see the triangles in the middle this chart also depicts causation and evolution the soul of being as interlaced a relationship between wisdom intuition and will and its dynamic what is not shown here and is what Swedenborg adds to the systemization is love. Love would be the very divine itself, an operative emanating throughout, including the lower man and guided by what he calls the ruling love. An important observation regarding Bailey's chart three, while it does not display the term love, Bailey and her many works repeatedly couples together the terms love intelligence, love wisdom. So we must, when viewing this chart, recognize love is not missing, but rather implied. Bailey's solar logos is our great cosmic life. It's the fire expressing itself and circulating in the soul, the body, the monad and pers personality. And as love wisdom, love intelligence, forms the basis of our hierarchical brotherhood and the communion of our saints, who are those who are operative on both visible and unseen spheres. They work together, and within the United Kingdoms, they communicate as the muses we experience, the inspirers, all the thinking shared. This is what Swedenborg encountered as he entered the celestial and spiritual angelic kingdoms, and it was the foundation of his ethics and morality. This intermeshing of the fires betwixt the lower and higher realms is described this way by Bailey. The solar angel in meditation deep communicates with his reflection. The lower light is thrown upward. The greater light illuminates. The energy circulates. The point of light groweth. Swedenborg's angelic communications provide insight into his revolutionary speculative thinking that heaven and hell were not places occupying spaces as was commonly thought at the time. They were the experience of the inner man. The varieties are infinite and equilibrize each other. They were always in harmony. Most men in the world, Swedenborg wrote, had no idea of what is meant by the internal or the external man. They had no idea of what he called discreet degrees, that by which the understanding apprehends and receives distinctions. A work entitled Discrete Degrees in Successive and Simultaneous Order, written in 1879 by Reverend Burnham, provides a compilation of color charts. It was his attempt to depict Swedenborg's work. Note the similarity with Bailey's chart three. These charts pictorialize the scientification of the spiritual experience, our receptivity of the gifts received, the intermingling of the soul-mind-body relationship in its natural forms and spiritual, its intersection and overlay with our subjective and objective experience. Diagram one depicts the manifested natural world and the unmanifested spiritual world. And we have two views, one above the other, and the second view, one within the other. By opening and allowing one's mind and spirit to the love God wisdom and receiving the revelations, man exhibits not only on the ethical and moral level, but the divine purposes, that is building the kingdom of God, a paradisical state of being, in the here and in the now. Looking a little closer at diagram three, we see what Swedenborg called the inmost. The inmost is the soul. The soul is where God dwells. The color looks green here, but in the book, gold leaf was used. In diagram four, we see the will colored red, the white, the understanding. The will for Swedenborg is the receptacle of love and good. Below the mind is the spiritual body and its mixture, 
It has a quality like the mind and is operative at both the spiritual and natural levels. The spiritual countenance, according to Burnham, is found in both the angels and in man, and in man is the fire and light in his eyes. Diagram 35, here depicted as the seventh and last stage, the glorification of man as a divine being. This diagram sets up a paradox, of course, for Christian thinkers, the problem of time. This final stage not only commenced, but was completed via the passion of the cross and the resurrection. Take a look at diagram 16, the last image. We see the outermost circle. It represents what Swedenborg calls the limbus, a Latin term meaning border, fringe, edge. For Swedenborg, this is the purest thing in nature. It is where nature touches or meets the spiritual world. Man's immortality and the formation of the eternal memory and identity is preserved in the limbus. Of course, this sets up for us the idea of a distinct, and separate human being. Think back for a moment on the Shavatash Vatara Upanishad, specifically the idea of the one. Compare that with this notion of the limbus, that which preserves our individual identity. Another theosophical thinker, G.D. Purakar, understood the paradox of the one and the many. In the studies in occult philosophy, he presents an article entitled there is no eternally unchanging principle in man. He saw Leibniz has monads that are similar to every other monad, but only slightly distinct. Now Swedenborg has introduced this notion of the limbus. GDP's answer appeals to the teaching of the Buddha. To think that there is in me a soul or spirit which is in essence different from the soul or the spirit in you, or in any other being or thing is the great heresy of separateness. It is the great illusion, the Mahamaya. GDP writes that there is no such principle of separation. Yet, yet, there are in man numberless lives which compose him as a composite or constituted being. This problem of the one and the many was recognized by Swedenborg when positing the limbus. As a counterbalance, he did employ what he calls the proprium. The proprium is a Latin term meaning own, referring to one's own self. The idea of the proprium can get complex as there are different forms. It coordinates with, with what is known as the ruling love. We are ruled by either our love for God, love for the neighbor, or love for self. Regarding the love of self, he writes, this proprium is the love of self and the love of the world. The love of self is such that it regards itself only and looks upon others as either vile or of no account. The proprium is also the medium by which we through influx receive the goods and truths from God. What is given is given via the proprium. God, however, is not in the proprium while giving itself. It's not a tube. The tricky part, however, is that the proprium belongs wholly to God. God allows the proprium to appear as though it belongs to man. Man appears to have a distinct self. This appearance is what allows for what can be viewed as our participation in being. Keeping with our theme, what or who are the fired? According to Alice Bailey, a solar logos Though its origins are on a higher plane, its main focal point is on the cosmic mental plane expressing through three lower cosmic planes. A heavenly man forms one center in the body of the solar logos. The seven major planes are in the same relation as the human in the three worlds. The solar angel aligns itself to the logoic kundalini fires toward the center of our schema and this vitalizes the force from the cosmos itself, an extra cosmic electrical vitality which vitalizes the life within the form. The lords of the flame can be agents of creation, the totality of manifestation, forces of creative powers, the biblical archangels, the Manasaputras, spirits before the throne, all men, the product of other worlds, the rod of initiation wielded by the solar logos is called the sevenfold flaming fire. The sun, 
is the radiant result of the union of spirit and matter and may be the totality of the solar system. Blavatsky tells us that the sons of the fire are one in essence, that they were present at the dawn, the beginning of our Manvantara, and that they proceed from the undifferentiated as minds on both the higher and denser levels. Fire is the most perfect and unadulterated reflection in heaven as on earth of the one flame. It is, it's the substance, the divine substance, its permeation is everywhere. Our universe is in reality a huge aggregation of states of consciousness. The fire of knowledge burns up all action on the plane of illusion. Therefore, those who have acquired it and are emancipated are called fires. Though not the first, Swedenborg tweaked the teachings that came before him providing a more comprehensive understanding of correspondence, revealing that with all things of heaven and all things of man, there is an internal sense that the divine cannot be perceived even by faith without this understanding. He says this about the fires. Divine love and divine truth relate to each other like the sun's fire and its resulting light in the world. And the word fire signifies heavenly and infernal love, that which we find in the hells. Fire is divine love and every affection belongs to it. Love is the fire of life. Remember that love is the first and final cause. This is a photo recently released from Lucius Trust to author Isabel Blackthorne, who has authored a new biography, Alice Bailey, Life and Legacy. It shows Baman Wadia, who came to meet with Bailey, asking her to reconsider her departure from the Theosophical Society. Though she departed, her body of work is extremely important. HPB announced that a new age was coming. Bailey employed the term new age so often in her work, some call her the mother of the term. Our new age, however, was not awaiting Blavatsky's prediction. It proceeded centuries earlier. We are told that Swedenborg made a lot of speculative noise, so much that some consider him the father of new age thinking. His scientific achievements were so noteworthy that he was inducted into the Royal Society. Although his colleagues were Edmund Haley and Isaac Newton, he is remembered for his encounters within the spiritual world and for documenting the experience, revolutionizing our understanding of the theological and our world of experience. His influence was so worldwide, influencing such as Johnny Appleseed, Helen Keller, Carl Jung, Yeats, Calvin Coolidge, Emerson, Elizabeth Barrett, and this list goes on. He excelled and advanced a variety of disciplines ranging from astronomy to anatomy to chemistry. He also wrote poetry in Latin. He was an engineer and naturalist, an inventor. The top right of this slide displays a drawing of his flying machine sketched when he was 26. We know that Leonardo da Vinci did the same, but what makes this sketch noteworthy, according to Ernst Benz, is that Da Vinci's airplane, though conceived before Swedenborg's, it came to be known in the 19th century, much later. His colleague, Christopher Poham, a Swedish scientist and inventor who made many contributions to industrialization, expressed skepticism about whether or not this craft was possible. And Swedenborg responded, borrowing a quote from the French author, Fontenelle, he said, the art of flying is hardly yet born. It will be perfected. Someday people will fly to the moon. Do we pretend to have discovered everything or brought our knowledge to a point where nothing can be added? Oh, for mercy's sake, let us agree that there is something still left for the ages to come. I agree with you. It took us more than 200 years, but... 
wow, we actually made it. Do any of you remember that moment? Do you still get chills when thinking of it? This was a dream made manifest. Not only did we make it to the moon, we have reached even further, traveling close to the sun. On the left is an artistic rendering of the Parker Solar Probe, its mission to secure particles from the corona. On the right is a photo of the James Webb Telescope, its mission to peer back 13 billion years into the beginning of our universe, to view the intergalactic medium, the first luminous sources such as the stars, the galaxies, and quasars. These, remember, are the most dense fires of our solar system. What you see here is the rendering of the expansion, the evolution of the solar system occurring after what people think the Big Bang. The theory regarding the spark that ignited our universe. If true, this would be the outer sheath of the solar logos, the divine fire. Perhaps we'll soon know if, if Blavatsky and Bailey's cosmologies are correct. I apologize for that, I jest. What you see here is the rendering of the expansion, the evolution of our solar system, the outer sheath of the solar logos. On this physical plane of experience, we are discovering so much about the sun. This is the world's largest solar furnace where the rays are reflected onto 9,600 mirrors. Imagine that, equivalent to concentrating the energy of 10,000 suns. We are now not only living in the outer spaces, but we are militarizing it. The United States Space Force is no longer a fiction. We even employ artificial intelligence to assist with this endeavor. The amount of debris in orbit around the Earth, a result of our exploits in technology, has become a recognizable problem. Theosophy and its method of discernment never left such a footprint on the fragility of our being and on our sacred spaces. Man's quest knows no bounds and seeks to reach even further, striving now to manipulate the rays of the sun, developing new fields such as geoengineering. This apparatus is designed to control climate change by diminishing the sun's impact upon the earth. Sweden, Emanuel Swedenborg's birthplace, recently opposed having this device launched from its nation. Before proceeding, a question for later discussion today or tomorrow. It's pertinent, I think. In the wake of all this technology, are our scientists simply performing the work of the Haya Chohan? Is the microcosm simply mirroring the macrocosm since we're one, a, a unity of being? Blavatsky writes in stanza four, listen, ye sons of the earth to your instructors, the sons of fire. I ask you, what does this type of instruction from Blavatsky imply? In the Golden Precept, we find the teaching, Lanu, thou art the doer and the witness, the radiator and the radiation, light and the sound, sound and the light. This teaching is to help guide us through the five impediments. Let's get back to Earth, for that is where Swedenborg spent his early years as an assessor of minds and engineer. His family was very affluent, powerful, and political, excelling in the three realms, nature, the state, and religion. They were successful miners in the Great Copper Mountain. They owned the Sweden estate, located just two kilometers from the Great Pit at Falun. The Great Pit is pictured here. It is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's open to tourism. His father, Jesper Swedborg, was a professor of theology and was a powerful bishop in the Swedish Lutheran Church, extremely pious and believed in direct communication with God, spirits, and the angels, and was well known for his skills performing exorcisms. It is evident when reading Swedenborg, his upbringing in the mining and engineering and the religious world had great impact. He emerged from these two worlds, favoring, however, 
the world of science, the study of nature. These were beckoning, beckoning him onward. In 1734, he wrote the first principles of natural things. And that same year, he wrote the infinite and the final cause of creation. You will see how these two realms follow him throughout his thinking and his religious documentations. A thousand years of copper mining, the mining area of the great copper mountain in Falun. Falun is in central Sweden. The city's history is intertwined with the production of copper. The first mining activities here are put at the 8th or 9th centuries. Falun, by the 17th century, was producing more than two-thirds of the world's copper output. This huge space is the mine's largest single extraction area. Miners dug from the top downwards along veins of copper, leaving a 30-meter deep hollow. Swedenborg left the world of engineering and spending time in the hallows of the earth. He departed for England, and when he arrives in 1710, he carries the noble title of Baron. He was widely traveled, spoke five languages, wrote in Latin, try to imagine London at this time. It was a metropolis as our own, the bustling epic center of the Enlightenment. Swedenborg was in his prime, and so very accomplished, he became a member of Newton's inner circle. That was the locus of high society. He worked at the Royal Observatory alongside Malebranche, John Flamstein, Christopher Wren, who had just finished building St. Paul's Cathedral. He chose not to follow the religious practices of his father, and his father, after a while, cut off his allowance. The scientific revolution had come full sway. Taking the lead from Copernicus and Galileo, it was disarming false notions. The new thinking was dominating and affecting all realms of society. Swedenborg was fully enraptured. The Cartesian coordinates ushered in a new certainty. Newton's physics demonstrated the laws of nature explaining the hidden forces. Man adopted the new deism that God was a great machine. And not only the sciences emerged as dominant over religion with a ferocity, there was a paradigm shift in philosophical thinking as well. Descartes' powerful utterance an era earlier Cogito ergo sum, the I think. It severed man's clarity of the world. Descartes was seeking for certainty, while the certainty of his own existence was affirmed by his I think, therefore I am. Even if he were dreaming, he argued that mathematics and measurements told us more about the world was a higher and more precise principle. These mathematical systems were and remained devoid of Pythagorean insights here, there was nothing intrinsic to a number, nothing sacred, nothing profound. His, I think, is credited with severing the subject from the object. Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, although written after Swedenborg's death, exampled the thinking that emerged. That is, while we know that there are objects, we do not know what these objects are in themselves. This division of the subject-object relationship has been the most perplexing problem of our philosophical thinking ever since. Swedenborg was fully acquainted with the works of philosophical thinkers. He read Plato, Aquinas, Martin Luther, and the writings of his own prestigious father, but he was now under the influence of natural law and reason. The empiricism of Roger Bacon and David Hume, John Locke's ideas of liberty and freedom were ruling the day, and despite all this, Despite his entrenchment, something extraordinary occurred. When he was in his mid-fifties, without warning, an extraordinary crisis shook. It shook him so that he fell from his bed. He says that he fell on the body of God. And the next day, he confronted Jesus. And, and they gave him what he calls a mission. A mission from God. Sounds wonderful in theory. But for all of us, this is more than theory. This is the voice of silence. This is the call we hear, the touch and warmth we feel. It guides us onward to a higher and more ethical and moral transformative consciousness. 
our feet remain on the earth, yet from within these old traditions we are blended, we are churned. Our emotional, psychological, our intellectual self is transformed. What's at stake? What doubts and tensions surmount? What grounds our belief? Or how do we trust these new behaviors? Of course, Swingborg, like we had doubts, his colleagues thought him mad. And at times, of course, he questioned. He wrestled with the various tensions, the analytic mind, the mystical, the empirical, the transcendent. How do any of us leave the world of the secularized empirical certainties and behold the inexplicable? Sometimes this transformation happens in gentle, unrecognizable stages. Sometimes the experience is a psychic climax, the result of hard work and study. And at times, the conflict seems unsurmountable. Despite his conflicts, something enabled Swedenborg to hold the rod of initiation and permit his soul to engage in its regenerative stages and thereby acquiring self sacralization, a term I borrow from the German sociologist Hans Jonas. And as a result, the person is universalized. And from this we can grasp, but not in its entirety, the notion of Swedenborg's God-man. Swedenborg held his gaze, and with the assistance of angels, he asked from whence come the ideas that guide, and from there he developed the doctrine of influx. Ideas come from the divine itself, an idea similar to Plato's doctrine of participation. But what is more important, though these ideas are not identical, is that both these thinkers engaged and promoted the idea of a divine intercourse. From here, he took on the mission, delivering to humankind the truths of the heaven and life on earth. Swedenborg, with hardship and ease, brought forth many contributions to theology and philosophy, and we, like him, are also disciples working on some aspect of the cosmic plane. Bailey expresses this thought about discipleship. Happy are those who can bring the vision nearer to humanity, the materialization of the vision, remembering the work is never the vision of one man, and only with united effort can it be brought into outer form. Swedenborg not only recorded his dreams, but he perfected the art of meditation, controlling not only his breath, but his hypnagogic states with an unabashed stamina. He proceeded with the same exacting certitude he exhibited in his scientific pursuits, engaged in a new theoretical activity which did not vanish in the face of direct perception. Though he wrote of two worlds, this division was a tool of language, and all of his acuity was targeted to mend the divide of faith and reason, of subject and object, experience and perception, and understanding. Swedenborg constructed a new framework, and we see herein the seedlings of a new and early hermeneutics. We now say with confidence that we are spiritual beings. But what is this spiritual world? Is it a dream state? In what way is it perceptual? In what way actual? Some view it as the world of disembodied spirits, of ghosts and ghouls hiding in the shadows. Some view it as the astral world experience. Who knows? This, this may be true. But for Swedenborg, it, it was much, much more. I have collaged together two images from the artist Marcel Duchamp to help us grasp this notion, which some call subjective objectivity, our spirituality. Take note of the steps in the center of the image. Allow your eyes to gaze from the right, the bottom of the steps, to the upper left. Think back while you do so on the intelligible planes of the solar logos. Now let's have the abstract work at the upper left, the highest step, represent the divine, Swedenborg's inmost. And the image on the lower right, the physical world of sense perception, the lowest plane. 
Notice that while you do so, your eyes and mind are flowing back and forth. Now note that this is also the same man and a single sacred moment of existence. Eliminating the movement as taking place in a time and a space and we are able to view this one man gaze upon his dynamics in one perceptual moment, this one man occupying all the stages within the light. It is by opening our hearts and minds up to the influx from God that we can see coupled with our understanding and hence experience these various levels. These are the various levels of our spiritual experience. It is multifaceted. Without a perception of what correspondence is, there can be no clear knowledge of the spiritual world, according to Swedenborg. There is a correspondence of all things of heaven with all things of man. This knowledge excels all other knowledges. The whole natural world and all of its particulars correspond. The natural world, in fact, springs forth, and its existence is thereby permanently sustained. This is the living language of God. Though Plato and the Neoplatonists also brought forward this light, as did Jesus who spoke in parables, and even those more ancient, correspondence is for the most part a lost language, due to what Swedenborg calls a withdrawal from God and the heavens. Some, though they have withdrawn, do have glimpses of this language when they become aware of synchronicities, and aware or not, their higher mind is fully bathed in the truths and the light of being. This turning towards the love of self and love of the world, this turning away from the Socratic admonition, know thyself, to a thinking that objects are present without any significant meaningfulness is cause. Correspondence includes more than just man. There is an intercorrespondence of the heavens. This implies a greater and a more richer relationship with the unfathomable. Both Blavatsky and Bailey write that it was through their association with the Tibetan D.K. and his mind of limitless vistas that they were able to carry forth their project. It is from the angels that Swedenborg received his higher truths. Blavatsky references Swedenborg in her secret doctrine and agrees with his ideas on time and space. She called the universe an aggregate of states of consciousness, conveying also that space is not a container. Swedenborg wrote that regardless of the fact that everything appears to happen in sequences and progression, the higher mind and the angels know nothing of time and space. Changes occur according to the states, the result of love and faith, wisdom and intelligence. These states exemplify various intensities, intensities of delight, loves, wisdoms. The natural consciousness glimpses this when realizing that moments are without duration. Sometimes our moments do not even include the sense of self, only the sense of being. Angels draw nigh to other people when in similar states and are far from those in dissimilar states. An example would be like we here who are now now together in the same state of consciousness one that has no division, no bounds. When the probium of man is set aside, that is the loving of oneself is set aside, man can be drawn into the same awareness. This is how Swedenborg was able to make his predictions, see objects from afar, intercourse with the dead, and also travel to other worlds and commune with worldly and otherworldly intelligences. His insights guided his exegesis of the Bible. His work, Arcana Celestia, was a move from a literal to a spiritual interpretation, a rather progressive dive into the Holy Scriptures, an act from which we profit. 
he examples how the divine is fully present, not only in nature, but in the very written language itself, even into a dotted eye. A full immersion would allow not only one to read from a distance about the Garden of Eden, but to be there, intimately, in the full beauty of its holiness, and able to participate in the paradisical innocence. While the Swedenborg Concordance is a complete work of reference to the theological works of Emanuel Swedenborg, I provide a cautionary note. It contains a glossary of terms. One ought to remember that his goal was to move away from the literal, away from the static and fixed. Therefore, though terms are herein defined, the language of correspondence is organic, it's thriving, it's living, it's neither fixed, static, or dogmatic. The doctrine of uses unveils creation as purpose, tending from and towards the good. God extends throughout creation via uses, expanding the heavens and the divine love and the divine wisdom. Regarding mankind, all of the objects in our lives have uses. To know the form and its inherent goodness indicates the nature of its use. For an example, God emanates through the suns and the atmospheres reaching man and conjoining to the starry heavens and into the seedlings in the ground and to the very organs in the body. Man is guided, he thrives, he flourishes and is nourished. It has often been said that man is the hand of God. We see evidences in man's engagement in the charities, the arts, the sciences and the humanities. Heidegger had insight and crafted the phrase ready at hand. We can view our modern day economic system as employing this knowledge, unfortunately encouraging widespread consumerism, a dependency on technology, coupled with a focus on the virtue of selfishness or self-love. Resultingly, we now witness what some call the climate catastrophe. We are learning. It is obvious that our understanding of utility and specifically the resources provided by nature must be re-evaluated. The confusion, of course, also springs from what we understood, the law of abundance which surrounds. But we must more conscientious caretakers be. Our youth are wholly aware of our current day estrangement from nature and is advocating for a new emergence. We have come far through all the realms of the sacred, and despite what Max Weber calls disenchantment and meaninglessness, a condition many think emerged from the 17th century European secularization and competing traditions, Hans Jonas suggests that causal factors can be witnessed in ancient Judaism with the suppression of Gnostic literature, the suppression of magic, promoting a loss of meaning and rendering our actions as no more than causal. Jonas is also suggesting that there is a re-enchantment that's always in engaging our lives. We are always participant, even though we have the inability to communicate it. Of course, we will always face problems. New challenges emerge, some old remain, and we will meet them head on, recognizing and remembering that we are engaged in a grand coalition. With so many lessons learned, we should ought and always remain in the calm of stillness, recognizing that we are not alone, but have the higher heavens and our in-breath as a foundation. In my discussion, I have attempted to touch upon in part the fundamental questions as it pertains to our spiritual experience from a theosophical perspective, who we are, what we are, when, where, and why. Our summaries are but a tiny crack in the cosmic egg one question, perhaps too circular to be answered, remains. Why is there something rather than nothing? Our precious theosophical science is not only the highest speculative science, but it is pragmatic, practical, and forms our very livelihood. It formalizes our character at its very core, and it provides the illuminations, the light of our understanding, as we live out our daily lives and fulfilling our purposes alongside the brotherhood of souls, the sons of fire. And lastly, 
Let us heed the words of the Lord Buddha. We must not believe a thing said merely because it is said, or traditions, because it is handed down, no writings because sages wrote them. We ought to believe when the writing, doctrine, or saying is corroborated by our own reason and consciousness. <laughs>